All right, good afternoon. Come on, I get the, the food coma session. <laughs> this is going to be good. This is going to be good. Well, this morning, as uh, Matt was giving his brilliant talk for you on the formational church, what does a formational church and a formational home look like? I know maybe some of you are saying in your own mind, you're saying, when he was saying, you, we want a formational church, we want a formational home, you were saying, inconceivable. Inconceivable. Well, I'm here to tell you that word you keep saying does not mean what you think it means. <laughs> it means, it does not mean what you think it means. So I talk about formational church, and we're going to talk about the broad version of what that looks like. In, our, in the book that will be coming out through our partner in Moody uh, next year, we'll talk more into the specifics. But, but what is a formational church? How can we help to form the parents that God has placed in our care? I love to read. I always have. When I was a kid, I loved reading. I still do. Some of my favorite books when I was a kid were the books where you got to choose your own adventure. You remember those? Choose your adventure. You know, you'd go, you'd pick a thing, you'd go to the next page. It was so amazing. You got to choose how your story went. You got to choose how your story ended. There's something so powerful about that. I think, I think as a kid, you just really know that there's something so powerful about stories. And I think sometimes we lose that as adults because we drown in facts and figures. But there's something so powerful about stories because they point beyond themselves. They, they capture our imagination and they point us beyond ourselves to a greater truth, to a better world that exists. They are more fundamentally true than, the, than sometimes even the world that we presently experience because they tell us something of how the world should be. G.K. Chesterton says this, he says, fairy tales are more true not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. See, in our scientific age, we, we love numbers and facts and predictable certainty. We have all of those things in abundance, but you know what we are right now in this, in this day and age in, in our world is we're short on stories. We're short on stories. And stories are important because Stories help us to find our bearing in a world that is crazy. Stories help us to understand and make sense of the world that God has made. And, and see what's so amazing about the God that we serve is this, is, is sometimes we can get so caught up in theological precision and trying to say the right things, and I'm all for theological precision, believe me. But sometimes we can get so caught up in trying to say the right thing or do the right thing, we, we, we make the Bible this instruction manual or this owner's manual for life. And the Bible is not full of owner's manual things. It isn't full of facts and figures. You know what the Bible's full of? Stories. Stories. See, God could have done that for us. He could have told us exactly what to do. And I think a lot of us wish he would have done that. Do A, B, and C, because that's what we want to do. Just tell me what I need to do, and I'll get it done. But he didn't do that. He did, you know what he said to us? He said, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created everything. Two of the greatest storytellers in the 20th century were both British they're both friends, and they both have a very different take on it, but they were both amazing storytellers. J.R.L. Tolkien of Lord of the Rings, right? He, he believed that stories were an act of sub-creation, where we create worlds, just like God created the world that we live in, we create smaller versions of that as an act of sub-creation that reflects our creator. And he gave us Lord of the Rings, and he gave us Middle Earth. Lewis differed. He, he believed that the purpose of stories was to smuggle truth that you could put truth inside of a story and it could steal past things that were kids would be like, Meh, and it would get right to their heart. Lewis said this, he goes, I saw how stories of this kind could steal past a certain inhibition which paralyzed much of my own religion in childhood. Why did one find it so hard to feel as one was told they ought to feel about God or his sufferings? I thought that the chief reason was one was told one ought to feel that way. An obligation to feel can freeze feelings. Could one not, not steal past these watchful dragons? I thought one could. And so what he did was he smuggled mere Christianity into Narnia. 
Lewis felt the powers of stories would free us from the paralyzing power of facts and figures, of just stating re the reality of how things are. He felt like, you know what we need to do is we need to smuggle truth in stories. Of all the passages that, that we have talked about most, I think, in the last decade, two decades, that I've been doing kids' ministry, it's been Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 has been the go-to passage for kids' ministry leaders, and for good reason. Deuteronomy 6 tells us so much about who God is and what God has done for us. And see, the problem with us and, is that when we look at this passage, we often look at it in a scientific way. We're trying to figure out, okay, give me a model that I can take and I can reproduce in my church, and then we can do that, and then we'll get disciples. A plus B equals C. But God did not give us a formula. He told us a story. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Right? He sent his own son to die in our place, to rise again, to ascend to heaven, to intercede for us at the right hand of God. And one day he's coming back to make all things new. It's like every story. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. The other thing my, one of my English teachers often taught us is, is how to ask good questions of a story, right? Who, what, where, when, how, and why. All right? I see some of you guys' eyes tweaking right now because you're thinking back to your English class. Yeah, I see you. So we, we, the problem is, is, is we so often focus on the how and the what in ministry that we never get to the motivation of why. We never get to the what. And in Deuteronomy 6, what we see is this call to discipleship. And this focus is on trying to create this pattern, okay? When, when we walk, walk along the way, when we lie down, right? Those are, it's all super important. It's talking to us how it happens and where. But the part of the Deuteronomy 6, I think that is so beautiful that we miss, is why do we do discipleship? And what do our parents say? What do our parents say? We have to measure discipleship different. We have to have a different metric for discipleship. And we're going to be talking about that more as this day goes on. But this is such an important thing for me. I think when we look at discipleship, what we have to do is we have to look at this. We have to measure the success of discipleship of the next generation, not by asking, do our kids serve God? But by asking, do our grandkids, do our grandkids treasure Christ? And the reason that is so profound is this, is because it means that we have fundamentally, the gospel has fundamentally changed the lives of our kids so much that they think it is valuable, that it is beautiful, and they tell that story to their kids. See, discipleship will transform the heart of a community, it'll transform the heart of a person, and the way that we know that it is true is when they pass it to the next generation. D.A. Carson says this, that the gospel is always one generation away from extinction. The basic thing that we have to understand is this, is that a formational church will understand is that discipleship is not just a formula to be mastered, but it's a story to be told. It's not just a formula that we write down and we copy from someone else's website, but it's a story that grips us in such a way that it transforms us in such a way that we tell our kids this story that is so beautiful and life-transforming. See, a formational church is obsessed with lasting transformation and disseminates information about who God is, but they're equally concerned about the inward motivation of the people that they're discipling. It's not just information transfer. It's saying, do you love him? with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, do you love him to that way, to, to that degree? Deuteronomy 6, 7 talks about the, the how and the where of disciple. We're very familiar with this. Is you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk about them when you sit in the house, when you lock, walk along the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. This part we know well, and this is important. We're to teach our kids intentionally. And this is where we get Parents are primary. This is where they're walking all the way, where they're lying down. This is at home. But my passionate plea for you as kids ministry leaders is to help kid parents know what to do. 
Presence is important, but we want to be intentional about how we, we, we want to show the love of God to kids in practical ways. We want to have them memorize things that are true. We want, to, we want to put the word of God so deeply in the hearts of kids that they will remember it, even when they don't want to. Give them, teach them the Ten Commandments. Teach them the Apostles' Creed. Teach them the Lord's Prayer. Teach them to memorize Scripture. Don't just give them facts. Tell them a story. The why of discipleship. Deuteronomy 6, 6 says this. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. Impress them on your kids. And see, here's where we have to get real, leaders. This is the part we don't camp on long enough. Has your heart been gripped by the gospel? Has your, or has your heart been cluttered by organizational tasks? You cannot give your kids, your leaders, your parents, what you do not own. You can't give to them what you do not own. Has it gripped you? Has your love for God so gripped you that you cannot help but impress it on your kids? He said, it shall be on your heart. On your heart. This is, there's a discipleship crisis in North America. There's a discipleship crisis in North America. And the reason for that, I believe, is this, is that there are so many leaders, past, senior pastors included, that have never di been discipled themselves. They don't know how to disciple anyone because they haven't been discipled. It hasn't been modeled to them. And this has to change, and this starts with us. It has to start with, why am I doing what I'm doing? And you impress that on your kids. You model for them what it looks like to lay your life down for someone who cannot pay you back. That's the message of the gospel. Moses is saying is that, that these commands must grip your heart. And I can tell you, reading the Ten Commandments by itself will not grip your heart. It's a bunch of rules, and this is, what's, this is the problem with so many of the kids that walk away. It's, it's all rules and regulations because it has not gripped your heart, it has not gripped theirs. When you understand there shall be no other gods before you, when you look at what that means, it'll transform the way that you read Scripture. It'll transform the priorities of the ministry that you lead. If it has gripped you, what you will not do is not just give them a list of do's and don'ts, but you'll point them to a God who is infinitely more wise, infinitely more beautiful, infinitely more powerful than anything we could ever imagine. And that he loves them because he loves them because he loves them because he loves them. You tell them over and over again, he loves you. Kids will remember who you were way more than they'll remember the stories that you tell them, the messages that you preach. I know that's a little insulting and hard to hear. But they'll remember who you were. What gripped you is what they're going to remember who you were. What are you passionate about? What do you love? What has a hold on the affections of your heart? One of the girls from our kids' church, when I first started, recently wrote me a card. This is 25 years later. She wrote me a card. And this girl was a lot. You, you know who she is. <laughs> she would intentionally try to submarine my object lessons. You know what I'm saying? So I'd do like an object lesson where I have like this bittersweet chocolate and this, this, this milk chocolate, and I'm talking about how, how the ways of God are, are, are beautiful and we want them and they taste good. And, and the, the devil tries to imitate it. Right, so what does she do? Comes up front, eats the dark chocolate, baker's chocolate, horrible chocolate, and says, yum, that's the best chocolate I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> and I'm left with a big hunk of, uh, of, uh, of milk chocolate. And that's when I had to learn that in kids' ministry, you need plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, plan F, <laughs> and plan G. And usually you get to G. But she wrote me this letter, and, and this is what she said to me. This, first, she apologized, which she needed to. <laughs> she said, I'm sorry, and I said, you're forgiven. <laughs> and then she said to me, she said, this, this is what stood out to me. She said, my family life was broken and falling apart. And the best part of every week was coming to kids' church. The best part of every week. 
And see, the thing is, is, is back in those days, right, I did not fully understand the gospel in the way that I should have. I spent far too much time entertaining kids and not enough time preaching Jesus as clearly as I should have. And I regret every single one of those days. But you know what I realized that when I read that letter is how gracious and how good God is. I realized that even though I didn't clearly communicate the gospel as clear as I should have and I wish I could have, what happened was that the love of God and his love for me had so gripped me, but that's what she saw. What she saw was not my theological precision. What she saw was that my love for God was demonstrated in my love for her even when she was difficult. I, should have show, I showed them through my life even though I didn't say what I should have said perfectly. So we have to be obsessed and we have to help our parents be obsessed and say, this has to grip you. If, your kid, if, if, if it does not grip you, it will not grip your kids. And if it does not grip your kids, it will never grip your grandkids. So what should I have said? What should I have said? This leads to the last part of Deuteronomy 6, the part that we don't talk about nearly enough and we need to be talking about more. The what of discipleship. What should we tell our parents to say? Because our parents are looking to you as you are the professional, you are the person. They're looking to you. What are you going to tell them to say? And this is what we need to tell them to say. Deuteronomy 6, 20 through 22 says this. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And God brought us out of Egypt by his mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt, against Pharaoh, and all the household before our eyes. This is what we preach. This is what we teach our, our parents to proclaim with boldness and clarity is this. When our kids ask you, why do you do all those things? What is the meaning of all of that? This whole idea of understanding what we are to say comes from, first of all, if they were not teaching those commands, they would not be asking what are those commands. So we, in our homes, we need to be teaching the commands of God. We need to get back to a place where the kids in our church know how, what the Apostles' Creed is and know how to repeat it. We need to teach our kids what the Ten Commandments are so that they will ask us this question. So what is the purpose of the Ten Commandments? What is the Apostles' Creed? So that we can say this. We can tell them that when they are growing up in our churches, we have to tell them what is the meaning of this? And the temptation for us will be because God said so. The temptation for the us will be to say, you know what, because I said so, go, sit, go back to your circle. That'll be the temptation. The temptation is for us as parents is to say, you know what, it's bedtime. We'll talk about it in the morning. And you don't get to it in the morning. When your, parent, when your kids ask you, why do you do what you do? Why are we different? from all the other people around us. Why do we believe what we believe? Don't give them a command and say, because God said so, tell them a story. Tell them the story of God's redeeming love. How God saved you when you did de deserved it least. How God rescued you by his mighty hand. How many of you as parents have ever told your kids the story of how you came to faith. How often in, in, our, in our communities of faith do we bring people in that have been transformed by the power of the gospel and have them tell their stories of God's redeeming love for them to our kids. So that all these things that we're teaching, all these correct things that we're saying are understood in the context of what they do, what God does through them to us. He saves us, he redeems us, he restores us, he makes us whole. Eugene Peterson said this, is somewhere along the way, most of us pick up some bad habits of extracting from the Bible what we precariously, what we pretentiously call spiritual principles, moral guidelines, and theological truths, and then corseting ourselves in order to force a godly shape in our lives. It's a mighty uncomfortable way to go about improving our condition. 
And it's not the gospel way. Story is the gospel way. Story isn't imposed on our life. It invites us into its. See, our sin demanded God's perfection. And God, in his great wisdom and care and love and grace, gave us his perfect son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life, died in my place and your place. He rose again and ascended to the Father and is pleading the blood of Jesus for your life right now. Tell them that story. Tell them that story. The meaning of the commands of God is the gospel. What do these mean? It's the gospel. They point us to the need. What, why, do, why do we have all these rules? They're to show us, they're to reveal the sinfulness of our heart, the, sinful, the sinlessness of our Savior, and our need for his help. If we don't teach the laws of God, our kids will never see their need for a Savior. They'll never ask, why are we different? And we'll never be able to tell them the story of God's redeeming love. If we settle for commands and laws, minus the gospel, you know what we're going to get is moralists, not disciples. If we settle for morals minus the gospel, we'll get progressive altruists, not disciples. If we settle for worship minus the gospel, we'll get idolaters and not disciples. When kids ask the why behind the what that we're teaching, give them the gospel. When parents say, what do I say? Tell them to preach Jesus over and over and over and over again. Paint a picture of Jesus that is so incredibly beautiful and so incredibly great that every love in this world will pale in comparison to the beauty of God in Christ. The story that, that this father in, in Deuteronomy 6 tells his kid is powerful, but you know what? He says this. He says, you know what? When they ask the question, he said, we were slaves in Egypt, but God rescued us by his, his hand. It's an amazing story to tell, but we have an even better story. We have a story where God not only saves his people from evil, but God saved you and I from, through the greatest evil ever perpetrated in the history of mankind. He turned that around on itself for your good and his glory. See, discipleship is not something that happens automatically. It's something that must happen in every generation. It's not automatic. We, when we drift from the centrality of Christ's last command from being our first priority, when we drift from that, we get apathy that transforms into apostasy. And we see it, like John Tyson was saying, 70% of people, our kids walk away from the church. What I would like to know is how many of those kids walked away from the church before they got to the age of 13 and just didn't have an opportunity yet. This isn't a modern problem. This isn't something that's novel and new. This is something that always has been a problem. It was a, a problem in, in, in Israel. It's a problem for us today. But it has a solution. It has a solution. One of the most heartbreaking passages in the whole Bible for me is in the, the, the odd way that the book of Judges ends. Judges 17 and 18. The way it ends is, is kind of odd. And what we see in this, in this passage is there's a guy named Micah. And what he does is he forms this idol. And then he gets his sons to be his priests and to worship this idol because it's more convenient and because it's easy. Now, we don't have those problems today, thank God. And so then what happens is, is, enter this Levite. This Levite comes by and he says, hey, do you want to be my priest? I'll pay you well. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I'll be your priest and I'll lead your family in worship to this false idol. Next thing that happens is a band of warriors from Dan comes on a journey to find a place for themselves outside of where God had placed them. They're looking for their, a place outside of what God had provided for them. So they came to Micah's house, and they heard this Levite talk, and they recognized his voice, and they said, will you ask God for us if he will be with us when we, go, when we go take this land? And he went to God, and he said, he came back, and he said, God is with you. So he gave this, them this assurance that God was with them on their God-forsaken journey. They went, they took the land, and they came back, they took the Levite, they took the idol, 
and they set up worship. And so this Levite was now leading, leading a whole tribe of Israel to worship a false god. Dan settled in this, the safety of their own self-procured pr prosperity. They installed this false idol whose worship was facilitated by their false priest. This verse breaks my heart. It makes me realize that I need to take the commands of Deuteronomy seriously in my home and in my church and when I impress it on the hearts of the families and help them to disciple their kids well. This is what the verse says in Judges 8, 30 through 31. And the people of Dan set up a carved image for themselves. And Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses. Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. If Moses, the person who wrote Deuteronomy 6, had a grandson who led an entire tribe of Israel into false worship, how do we think we are exempt? This must not be something we say is important. It must be our one obsession. Our one obsession, rehearsing the story of God's redemptive love for you and for me. Tim Keller says that if we, uh, if we must look to the greatest king, we must look to the greatest king or else we'll look to some other king. But we will worship something. Lastly, he says this, three things I think that are helpful to us. Keller says that as parents and church leaders, our discipleship should be marked by three things. Number one is we must be consistent in our behavior. We must be consistent as parents and as leaders in our behavior. We must model for our, our kids what it's like to belong, to belong to a church, to belong to God. We must model what belonging looks like. Second thing is this, is us, we must be wise about reality. The things we communicate must be true and prepare them for the world, not protect them from it. We must proclaim to them what to believe and how to believe it and what is actually true in a world that is upside down. So we, we model for them what belonging to Christ looks like. We, we proclaim to them what believing looks like in a God who is true, good, and beautiful. Lastly is this, we must be warmly personal in our faith. We must tell the story of repentance and forgiveness. We must explain to them that when we belong to God, when we believe in him, what happens is that transforms us in such a profound way that we become like him in his sorrows. We become like what we behold. We must take this process of discipleship from Deuteronomy 6, where we, where our kids, where we, we talk to our kids when they lie down, when they walk along the way. But we cannot, we must not overlook the power of discipleship. And the power of, the, of discipleship is when we are gripped by the gospel, and when we faithfully proclaim the gospel to our kids, we, when our kids ask us, why do we do what we do? Why do we believe what we believe? Do not give them information, tell them a story. When we preach the gospel to the kids, remind them of who they were, who we were, but most of all, whose we are. Whose we are. Because if you do that, what happens is that they will see the commands of God as good and glorious and not grievous. They will see the commands of God as good and glorious, not grievous. When our kids in our kids' ministry ask us why we do what we do, when parents say, how do I talk to my kids about their faith? What is the purpose of all this? Tell them that we were slaves in Egypt and God rescued us by his mighty hand. Look at them and tell them the story of how God redeemed you. Point them to scripture over and over again about how God created this perfect world. He sent his perfect son and he's coming back to make it perfect once again. Tell them the story of God's redeeming love for them. We were slaves, but we have been redeemed by the mercy of God. Tell them the story of a God who redeems. Let's pray. God, we thank you. Lord, I pray for every single practitioner in this room, every single leader, kids ministry leader, pastor. And Lord, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts, Lord, that the gospel would grip us, that we would be gripped by the message 
of your love for us. Lord, that, that in this world that we broke, that you have come to redeem, that you are coming back to restore. Lord, I pray that the message that we proclaim to our kids over and over again is that they are loved more than they could ever imagine. And Lord, they're more sinful than they could ever believe, but you and your mercy redeem us by your grace. Lord, I pray that we would not just be good information passers, but Lord, that we would be powerful storytellers of the greatest story that every other story models itself after. Lord, the story of redemption that we find in Christ Jesus. Amen.